The White House Communications Department undergoing a major makeover as former press secretary Sean Spicer announces his exit. Spicer now speaking about his resignation for the first time with Fox News. I'm Rob Schmidt. In for Julie Banderas, this is the Fox Report. All right, Sean, Spiker's, Sean Spicer's abrupt departure uh, coming on the heels of the hiring of New York financier Anthony Scaramucci as White House communications director, a decision that Spicer reportedly did not approve of. Sarah Huckabee Sanders will now take over as White House press secretary. Spicer telling Sean Hannity last night he wants to give Sanders and Scaramucci a clean slate to start from. Have you been thinking about this for a while? No. So it was really sudden. Well, I knew uh, I knew what the right thing to do is. I think I have a pretty good compass, um, and I made a decision that it was in the best interest not of just myself, but in the in, for the president and for this administration um, was was to step aside and let Anthony and Sarah lead the team. Uh, and, but I knew right away that that was what was best for for this president, for this country, for this administration, um, and so I, I I followed that path. All right, Garrett Tenney live in Washington with more and uh, Garrett. Why did the president want to bring Scaramucci on board? Do we know? Well, Anthony Scaramucci has had a close personal relationship with the president for a number of years, and there's something of kindred spirits. They're both media savvy, self-made businessmen that have reputations as fighters. So this is someone who understands the president and can defend him in the way that he wants to see. But there was a lot of pushback on this decision from White House Chief of Staff Reince Priebus, as well as Chief Strategist Steve Bannon and Press Secretary Sean Spicer, none of whom liked the idea of bringing Scaramucci on board. But the former hedge fund manager, he was extremely comfortable in his first press briefing yesterday and said one of his goals is to work with the media to help them give the president a more fair shake. Today on Breitbart Radio, he also laid out how his, team, how his team can do a better job in pushing the president's agenda and getting Congress to support it. I do think that we can improve our messaging in a way where we create groundswells in those districts. And so people in the respective districts, both Democratic and Republican enclaves, uh, if we can get the message out, I think it's a pro-American, nonpartisan message. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, unanimity and appeal to what we're doing. In that interview, Scaramucci also said the president's border wall is at the top of the to-do list for the White House. And he's expected to officially take over as communications director in a couple of weeks. Rob? Well, Garrett, Scaramucci has been a pretty fierce defender of the president, but uh, not for so long, only in recent times. He's had some harsh words for him in the past, right? Yeah, and you saw that yesterday in the briefing when he was asked about calling then-candidate Donald Trump a hack politician just a couple of years ago. He said that it is one of his biggest regrets and that the president reminds him about it about every 20 minutes or so. <laughs> in terms of policy, though, he has also had a number of positions over the years that are in direct opposition to the president's. So today he tweeted, full transparency. I'm deleting old tweets. Past views evolved and shouldn't be a distraction. I serve POTUS agenda and that's all that matters. Now, some of those deleted tweets include this one from 2015 when he wrote, Walls don't work, never have, never will. The Berlin Wall, 1961 to 1989, don't fall for it. Then in 2012, he tweeted, we, the USA has 5% of the world's population, but 50% of the world's guns. Enough is enough, it is just common sense, it apply more controls. And just a few months ago, he tweeted this about climate change. You can take steps to combat climate change, without crippling the economy. The fact many people still believe climate change is a hoax is disheartening. But as he said yesterday in his new position, his focus is simply on pushing the president's agenda, not on his own. So now he's trying to put the, all of that out there so that everyone can move on from it. And deleting Stop. those tweets, those are three big about faces. So we'll see how that goes. Garrett, thanks so much. You got it. Be sure to catch Fox News Sunday tomorrow. Anchor Chris Wallace will sit down with Anthony Scaramucci. The incoming White House communications director will discuss the shakeup in the West Wing and President Trump's future agenda. That's tomorrow right here on the Fox News Channel. Check your local listings for the time. All right, meanwhile, President Trump traveling to Virginia today to help commission a multi-billion dollar naval warship. The president visiting Naval Station Norfolk to preside over the commissioning ceremony for the USS Gerald R. Ford, named, of course, for our 30th president. 
Mr. Trump praising the mines and muscle used to build this new state-of-the-art aircraft carrier. As we put this stunning ship into the service of our nation, we must also pay tribute to the thousands of citizens, military and civilian, who helped design and build her. Their love of country has been poured into every rivet and bulkhead on this vessel. Well, Kristen Fisher has more from the site of today's dedication in Norfolk, Virginia. Well, this speech really focused on two things. First, to the sailors that will man this ship and to the nearly 9,000 shipbuilders who built it, many of whom were here today. And then second, this speech was also a salute to the ship itself and what it means to the U.S. Navy and our country. This ship is the deterrent that keeps us from having to fight in the first place. But this ship also ensures that if a fight does come, it will always end the same way. We will win, win, win. We will never lose. We will win. Now, this was Made in America week for the White House, and what better way to end it than with the commissioning of the largest and most sophisticated warship ever built, made entirely right here in Virginia. So there's a lot about this carrier that President Trump loves, but there's also a lot that he doesn't like. It was billions of dollars over budget, several years behind schedule, and it's still not finished. In fact, it won't actually be able to be deployed for a few more years, likely until 2021. During this speech, President Trump also put pressure on Congress to pass a budget that would include his proposal to increase defense spending by an additional $54 billion next year. Now we need Congress to do its job and pass the budget that provides for higher, stable, and predictable funding levels for our military needs. So call that congressman and call that senator and make sure you get it. You can also call those senators to make sure you get health care. So President Trump not missing an opportunity to continue to push for health care reform, despite the Senate bill's demise earlier this week, though he made no mention of the major staff shakeup that just took place back in D.C. Back to you. Okay, Kristen, thank you. The head of the Minneapolis P Police Department stepping down after the deadly shooting of an unarmed Australian woman. Police Chief Janae Harto resigned yesterday at the request of the city's mayor. The ordeal starting when the victim, Justine Damon, called 911 to report a possible sexual assault in an alley behind her home. A short time later, she was shot by Officer Mohammed Noor, uh, one of the responding officers, as she approached that squad car in the dark. The mayor of Minneapolis says she's already nominated a new police chief to make cultural changes. Transformational change is difficult, it is uncomfortable, it takes time, and it is worth doing because there is a better city and a better world on the other side of it, whatever the transformation needs to be. And that's what we've been doing here in Minneapolis. All right, Brian Yenis joins me now here live in the studio. So why did the mayor force the chief out? I mean, simply put, Rob, the Minneapolis Mayor Betsy Hodges says she and the people of Minneapolis lost total confidence in Police Chief Janae Harto's ability to lead the police force for any longer. And frankly, there is community outrage and frustration as to how this shooting unfolded. The officer who shot Justine Damon, Mohammed Noor, and his partner did not have their body cameras turned on at the time of the shooting. Secondly, the victim's family is frustrated at the lack of information coming out of the investigation. And thirdly, this is an international incident now. Damon was an Australian woman who was here in the U.S. to marry the love of her life. And plus, there has been multiple controversial shootings in Minneapolis over the last three years. Jamar Clark, an unarmed 24-year-old black man killed in November of 2015. Last July, Philando Castile was shot and killed during a routine traffic stop. And now, Damon. Justine was a beacon to all of us. We only ask that the light of justice shine down on the circumstances of her death. Thank you. Now, the shooting led to a protest of about 200 people downtown yesterday, a few dozen even interrupting a press conference by Mayor Betsy Hodges. We do not want you as the mayor of Minneapolis, and we're asking you to resign. I will not be resigning. Um, and like I said, it is understandable to me that, uh, you know, people's frustration is high. I share that frustration. 
Now, the city's police chief, Janae Harto, resigned Friday at the request of the mayor. And in a statement, Harto said, quote, I have to put the communities we serve first. I've decided I am willing to step aside to let a fresh set of leadership eyes see what more can be done for the MPD to be the very best it can be. Rob. A any more information as to exactly? I mean, I, I heard the, the theory that maybe it was fireworks that uh, startled the officer when he shot. Any information on how this happened? There's not a lot of new information, yeah. except for the fact that there is a new witness who happened to be bicycling by, um, and they that witness has spoken to investigators. Reportedly, this witness may have videotaped a part of this encounter. Again, from what we understand, Justine called 911 twice last Saturday to report a possible sexual assault happening in the alley behind her home. Officer Noor and his partner drove up, and at that time, Noor's partner says they heard a loud noise, Rob, and that startled them, and at the same time, Dave and came up to the police cruiser nor shot her from inside the vehicle. Now, nor is on administrative leave and he has yet to speak to investigators. Yeah, he doesn't want to talk publicly. I remember that. Not. Okay, Brian, thanks so much. Thanks, All right. Okay, right now, bloodshed in the Middle East as tensions boil between Israelis and Palestinians. Look at that, how both sides are reacting to Friday's deadly attacks over a holy site there. Also, Hollywood loses a veteran actor. I'm sure you recognize that face. John Hurd, best known for playing the dad in the Home Alone films, has died. The actor was found dead yesterday in his California hotel room where he was recovering from back surgery. He was a very successful theater actor before he appeared in a wide range of TV and film roles. A lot of those in the 80s, like the Tom Hanks film Big, the uh, Pelican Brief as well, Beaches, also the show The Sopranos. John Hurd, 71 years old. Well, a setback for a U.S.-backed coalition fighting the Taliban in Afghanistan as a U.S. airstrike kills at least 12 friendly Afghan police soldiers, or police officers, I should say. It happened yesterday during an operation against Taliban insurgents in the southern Helmand province. Their deaths come amid increased fighting in that area, which is controlled by the Taliban. NATO and U.S. troops are assisting Afghan troops in that area, and the U.S. offering its condolences to the families of the security forces who were killed. All right, more Israeli troops deployed to the West Bank and placed on high alert this one day after six people were killed in widespread Israeli-Palestinian clashes. Authorities say a Palestinian stabbed three members of an Israeli family to death in a Jewish settlement yesterday. This just hours after three Palestinians were killed in violence prompted by new security measures at Jerusalem's holiest site. John Huddy has more from our Jerusalem Bureau. Rob, Israeli officials are calling last night's deadly attack in a West Bank settlement a massacre. There are crime scene photos just too graphic to show, but in one, the kitchen floor of the home where an Israeli family was eating their Shabbat meal is stained with blood. The attack happened in the West Bank settlement of Halamish, where police say a 20-year-old Palestinian man snuck into a home through an open back door and stabbed to death a father and his two grown children. The mother, who was also stabbed, was rushed to the hospital. She survived. The son's wife managed to hide her children in a room. They were unharmed. A neighbor who heard the screaming rushed to the family's home and shot the attacker, who also survived. Before his assault, he posted on Facebook what he called a last will, writing, quote, I'm going to die for the Al-Aqsa. He's referring to the Al-Aqsa Mosque in the Temple Mount compound, where Israeli police installed metal detectors at the entrances following a deadly attack there last Friday in which two police officers were killed. Since then, rioters have clashed with police in Jerusalem and parts of the West Bank. Three Palestinians have been killed in the violence and more than 400 others injured. Since last night's attack, Israel has poured more troops into the West Bank, while Israeli security forces remain on high alert and posted outside the old city walls. And the question now is whether or not Israel will stand firm on keeping metal detectors in place outside the Temple Mount. Rob. All right, thanks so much. A series of aftershocks leaving locals and tourists on edge after a deadly earthquake rocks the packed summertime Greek islands and the shores of Turkey, damaging some very precious architecture as well. Plus law enforcement getting some backup in the skies with drones. But why this move is facing some pushback, that's ahead. What we don't want to see are drones become a tool for pervasive, suspicionless surveillance. Basically a way of 
letting the government look over all of our shoulders all the time. Well, crews assessing the damage caused by yesterday's powerful earthquake that rattled Greece, the islands, and Turkey. The quake killed two tourists and injured nearly 500 others across the region. Important archaeological sites suffered extensive damage on the island of Kos, including an Ottoman-era mosque. The mosque was truly destroyed, as were two churches, the cathedral, and one more church. And in cooperation with the Coast Metropolis, whose efforts we will support, we will immediately start repairs. Well, a number of uh, jittery residents there and tourists staying as far away from buildings as they can, following a series of aftershocks that also frightened a lot of people. Hundreds of people spent last night sleeping outside. Fortunately, it's summertime. Law enforcement agencies now equipped with some new aerial tools using drones as a bird's eye view to help aid in various investigations. But the move now meeting with some opposition as privacy groups are raising new concerns. Senior correspondent Rick Leventhal has more. Just one week after the Sheriff's Department in Cecil County, Maryland got its brand new drone up and running, it was asked to investigate a case of stolen construction equipment. Authorities in neighboring states suspected half a million dollars worth of bobcats and other small machines might be stashed on this property hidden from street level view. So the sheriff sent his Typhoon H Pro drone up over the land and quickly recorded this footage, enough to convince a judge to sign a warrant that night, leading to the seizure of the stolen equipment and the alleged thief's arrest within hours, believed to be the first successful use of a drone in a criminal case of this kind. I would say that flight was it was about as perfect as it could get. It it was flawless. The flight went off very well. I think we were in, in the air uh, a maximum of 10 minutes. Well, right now, it looks like we're getting the strongest signal about halfway down the wood line. Just the Sheriff's past. Department in Somerset County, New Jersey, hopes its drones can find missing people. Project Lifesaver offers wristbands to the elderly with Alzheimer's or dementia or children with autism. Usually years ago, when we had people wander off, we would bring out the rescue squad, the fire department, the volunteers, the canine if we had it and we'd search and search and search and never find a person. According to a study by the Bard College Drone Center, at least 347 police, fire and emergency units nationwide now deploy unmanned aerial vehicles and many more are in the purchasing stage, raising privacy concerns for groups including the American Civil Liberties Union. What we don't want to see are drones become a tool for pervasive suspicionless surveillance, basically a way of letting the government look over all of our shoulders all the time. The Clarkstown Police Department is training a dozen officers to be pilots and says citizens' rights are a priority. If they need to fly where someone has an expectation of privacy, they say they will get a warrant. In West Nyack, New York, Rick Leventhal, Fox News. All right, a sudden shakeup at the White House. Sean Spicer stepping down from his position as press secretary as the president makes a new addition to the communications team. Why he's moving on coming up and attorney general jeff sessions may be in hot water over his contact with a russian ambassador a new report suggesting the two engaged in more than just small talk during meetings last year let me be clear i never had meetings with russian operatives or russian intermediaries about the trump campaign I'm Rob Schmidt in for Julie Banderas. This is the Fox Report topping the news. A change of course in the West Wing with the sudden departure of Sean Spicer as White House press secretary. Spicer discussing his decision with Sean Hannity last night, just hours after stepping down. Walk us through that to the extent that you can share the conversation. You went in and you said you want to give them a clean slate. You know, give us a little of the back and forth between you and the president today in the Oval Office. Well, Sean, I, I, I will say this. Uh, I've never revealed private conversations that, the, that have been privy to the president. I will say, well, as I mentioned a moment. 
<laughs> as I mentioned. You're on, you're on your way out. You might as uh, well, you're right? right? You know what? You're, you're right. I'm on my way out. Why not? Uh, but uh, as I said, I went into the president after we had the discussion early with Anthony and Sarah about uh, what the president's desires were. And I said, sir, I've, I've had the opportunity to think about this. I think it is in the best interest of this administration and, and your presidency that I give these two individuals uh, the opportunity to, to operate without me in the way uh, so that they have a fresh start, that I'm not lurking over them. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's in the best interest uh, of the organization, of this administration, uh, and of his presidency. And so, he, uh, again, he, there was a, a bit of a back and forth. He's an unbelievably gracious uh, individual and, and wanted to make sure that I thought that that was in the best interest of myself as well. He's always thinking of others. And, uh, and I assured him that I would be just fine. He assured me that he would continue to be as supportive as he always has been. Uh, and, uh, and I told him I would stay on for a few weeks to ensure a smooth transition. He, uh, he accepted that. And, uh, and then we kept working hard to advance his agenda. Did you feel in any way that your role had been diminished. I mean, you started sharing the podium with, with Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Anthony Scaramucci comes in. Did you feel in any way that this was against you? Did you feel you were pushed out in any way or this was just totally your decision? No, the, by, as you mentioned, the president uh, obviously wanted to add to the team more than anything. I just think it, it was in the best interest uh, of our communications department, of our press organization, uh, to not have too many cooks in the kitchen. And so uh, I think that's that's a good quality. Uh, they need the, the team here that works so hard, so tirelessly to advance the president's agenda, need clear leadership. And, uh, and I thought it would be a bit confusing uh, having, having additional people at the top. And so I wanted to move on to give both Anthony and Sarah that clear lane um, in, in each of their respective areas. Uh, but look, we've been, we've been uh, working tirelessly uh, trying to advance this agenda. There's a lot of people here doing a lot of amazing work on the digital side, on our research side, on our press operation regionally. We had a very successful Made in America week this week, uh, garnering over you know, millions of impressions throughout the country of the amazing things, that uh, products that are come from around the country and that the president's working hard to keep and grow uh, the manufacturing base and the job base around this country. So uh, there's so much to be done, and we've got two additionally talented people that will continue to lead this effort forward. Was it hard for you when Saturday Night Live would go after you or, or other people, late night comments would attack you? I remember asking this one time and I remember your answer distinctly, but I wanna ask you before our audience here, was that hard? Did you have a sense of humor about it? Did it bother you deep down in any way? Well, I, I'm, I'm a prankster, so some of the, you know, I, I like a good joke. I think when it's funny, it's funny. You got to laugh at yourself and, and accept that there are some self Was Saturday Night things. Live funny? Did you like that or did that bother I, you? I think there are a couple parts of it that were funny, but there's a little bit, there's a lot of it that was over the line. It wasn't just, it wasn't funny. It was uh, stupid or silly or malicious. Uh, but there are some skits that I've seen on late night television that I had to crack up at. Uh, so sometimes <laughs> it can be funny. Some of the memes you have to, have to, have to laugh at yourself a little bit. Uh, but there are times when it goes from funny to mean, um, and, and that's, that's, there's a difference when that happens. Um, and again, to All your right. point, yeah, you have to have a little bit of a thick skin if you're going to do this. Have you thought a little bit about your future? Was this sudden for you, and you've been thinking about it for a while? I've always said that I was serving at the pleasure of the president. Uh, so, you know, I didn't spend a ton the of president time. Wanted we had, you to stay. Very, he does. And, and we had a very robust agenda. The president's doing so many amazing things on behalf of this country uh, that it was never, it was always about advancing that. But I'm really looking forward. My family's made a tremendous sacrifice to allow me to have this honor. And I really look forward to spending a lot of time uh, with my kids and my wife, who've really been unbelievably supportive to give me this just amazing opportunity that, uh, that the president Let allowed me to have. All right, Sean Spicer there with Sean Hannity last night. More major developments concerning the president's communication team. Anthony Scaramucci steps in as the White House communications director, and Sarah Huckabee Sanders will be taking over as the White House press secretary for those briefings. All right, a new chapter in the saga surrounding Russia and Attorney General Jeff Sessions. The Washington Post now reporting intercepted conversations between Sessions and Russian Ambassador Sergei Kislyak indicate the two talked about campaign-related issues during the 2016 presidential election. Claims that contradict previous statements made by Sessions. Here is the Attorney General back in March. The idea that I was part of a, quote, continuing exchange of information during the campaign between Trump surrogates and intermediaries for the Russian government is totally false. 
Ellison Barber has more from Washington. The Russian ambassador to Washington told his bosses he talked about campaign related matters with the now attorney general of the United States. That, according to a new Washington Post report, the conversations allegedly took place during the 2016 campaign. Sources reportedly told the Post Ambassador Sergei Kislyak's conversations with his bosses were intercepted by U.S. spy agencies. If true, it seemingly contradicts a number of statements Sessions made. I never had meetings with Russian operatives or Russian intermediaries about the Trump campaign. To the best of your memory, you had no conversation with Amb Ambassador Kislyak at that meeting? I don't recall it, Senator Warner. A spokesperson with the Department of Justice told Fox News she could not comment on the reliability of what anonymous sources describe in the Post article, but, quote, the Attorney General stands by his testimony. President Trump criticized the leak, tweeting a new intelligence leak from the Amazon Washington Post, this time against AG Jeff Sessions. These illegal leaks, like Comey's, must stop. It's at least the second time the president has publicly been almost as many days. In an interview with the New York Times, President Trump spoke about the attorney general and his decision to recuse himself from the investigations related to Russia and the election, saying, quote, he should have told me before he took the job and I would have picked somebody else. Clearly he has confidence in him or he would not be the attorney general. Trump's oldest son, Donald Trump Jr., and former campaign manager Paul Manafort are set to face questions from the Senate Judiciary Committee this week about a June 2016 meeting with a Russian lawyer. That's expected to take place behind closed doors. Rob? All right, Ellison Barber, thank you. The Trump administration announcing thousands of new visas will be made available this year for seasonal non-agricultural foreign workers. Homeland Security making the decision after claims of a labor shortage in this country. And Casey Stiegel has more from our bureau in Dallas. It's hot in Texas. We mow thousands of acres of turf a week. It's hard work. Masterful mowing is Jason Craven's mantra. His Dallas landscaping company is huge, employing 250 seasonal workers a year, 50 of whom are not U.S. citizens, working here under the same visa program the Trump administration just expanded. It's encouraging. You know, we um, we rely heavily on the, on the program. 15,000 additional H-2B visas will be made available for the rest of the year, well surpassing the previous of 66,000. Their jobs in construction. In fact, President Trump has utilized this particular visa for seasonal workers at his Mar-a-Lago resort. We have to put ads in the paper and we have to advertise for you know, about a month. Businesses must provide the feds with proof on how they tried to attract Americans first. A company also has to attest their firms would suffer permanent irreparable harm if they did not import foreign help. Craven insists he only hears from a handful of American applicants, yet critics of the program say that's not what the statistics show. There isn't uh, much data or evidence that uh, would establish that there are major national level labor shortages. Daniel Costa from the Economic Policy Institute faults U.S. companies, alleging many prefer it this way because it's cheaper to employ immigrants. They might be able to find uh, find workers if they if they raise the wages that they offered. But CEOs like Jason Craven say it's not reasonable to lump all companies together. Well, that was Casey Stiegel in Dallas. Supporters of the expanded program say they appreciate the attention being drawn to this, but they argue their seasons are nearly over. It might be too little too late, at least for this year. All right, the trial of an illegal immigrant accused of murdering a San Francisco woman has been postponed again. Juan Francisco Lopez Sanchez asserting his right to a speedy trial yesterday after his trial had been delayed a number of times. He's accused of shooting and killing 32-year-old Katie Steinle two years ago with a stolen gun. But his attorneys say evidence shows that he's innocent. It has all the physical traits of an accident. 
And that is why obtaining information about the condition of the weapon, the history of the weapon, whether it has ever unintentionally discharged in the past is crucial to this case. At this point, we don't believe that uh, his testimony is relevant uh, for whether or not uh, Juan Francisco Sanchez uh, Lopez pulled the trigger with implied malice. Lopez Sanchez is due back in court next Friday to continue uh, the scheduling proceedings. O.J. Simpson, the juice, will soon be a free man. The Nevada Parole Board unanimously deciding Thursday to release him after about nine years behind bars for a 2007 robbery. Simpson could go free as early as October 1. Judge Janine Pyro, uh, Pyro, I should say, sits down for an exclusive interview with Simpson's attorney, Malcolm Laverne. You can catch that tonight at 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern right here on the Fox News Channel. All right, a massive wildfire in California threatening homes near one of America's most treasured national parks. How the weather is complicating the efforts to fight this fire. That's ahead. Burn this one to the ground. Mine's safe. Burn. I'm not.